Good morning and welcome to this IFS 17 Nordic uh, event. I am Lars Christian Jørgensen, an audit partner here in Oslo, and I'm here to guide you through the two next hours. After many years of deliberation, the ISB have finalized both the standard and the related amendments. In addition, the EFRAG has sent their endorsement advice to the European Union, all with the effective date from 1st of January 2023. This means that the contract that the insurers issued today actually will be presented in accordance with IFRS 17. This is due to the uh, requirements of comparative information. This is actually how close we are to getting live with the standard. Therefore, many insurers are ramping up the project to get ready for implementing the standard. But all of those, all those of you who have been working with the standard acknowledge that IFRS 17 is a technical standard. Trying to use that one to the detailed product you have might be challenging, particularly given that it's a principle-based standard rather than a rule-based standard. But reflecting back on when the standard first were issued in 2017 and the technical accounting issues we then saw, some of them are still open, but we see a shift, a trend shift. Because when you saw the TRG discussions, those started off with the technical uh, interpretation issues and challenges, but moved on to more detailed implementation questions. Many of those issues uh, or the same trend we see in the local market as well. Insurers move, move ahead and have more detailed implementation questions regarding their journey. Thus, with great experience from quite a few IFRS 17 projects in the Nordic region, and the fact that we're able to leverage on global leaders and uh, IFRS 17 experts, we're here to give you some insights on uh, both local uh, IFRS 17 implementation journeys and challenges, as well as uh, the global perspectives. We'll start off uh, this journey with the introduction from each Nordic territory covering topics on where the regular regulatory rev environment is, as well also touch on some observations that we do have with, um, from implementation projects and where we see uh, the different insurers. After a round trip in the Nordic countries, we are pleased to have the Global IFR 17 leader, Alex Bertolotti, with us. He will probably shed some light over where we are in the global perspective, as well as we can see whether the global trends are relevant to the Nordic territories as well. One other aspect is that we are in the European Union. And to follow uh, the uh, FRAG discussions a few years ago, that was quite interesting. Um, we will also therefore touch with Alexander Dolhops, who is part of the FRAG Insurance Accounting Working Group, uh, to show some insights on the EU endorsement process. But we also do still have quite a few uh, interpret key interpretation issues ongoing. We will try to draw a parallel to see whether the global uh, issues are relevant for the Nordic issues as the Nordic uh, implementation projects as well. But as auditors, we have started thinking about how should we audit this standard. So the Swedish uh, insurance leader Morgan will, will, together with our global IFR 17 audit leader, guide you through how we think about audit of the standard. It's time to get on. But implementing IFR 17 without technology might be very, very challenging. So we have from the P PwC UK, the IFR 17 technology consulting leader, Alwyn Sviles, who will provide you with some insight on where we are on the vendor landscapes and so on. We will wrap up uh, this two hour event with uh, KPIs because it's unavoidable that IFRS 17 will change the way insurance business is judged. So Andrea from the UK will give us some insights on what to think about when it comes to the future KPI. Maybe questions like what's happened with combined ratio would be answered. But before we jump into the show, let me give you some practical, uh, some practical uh, information.
So if you scroll further down on your slide or your screen, you will see there is an option to ask questions. If you ask these questions, I will see those here in the, the studio. And I'll be able to ask the most recent presenter your questions. After the event, you will also receive um, a link to watch this one on demand afterwards. So let's start with a brief introduction of the Nordic snake. So many of you might have seen this snake. This snake tries to illustrate where the insurers are, uh, the way we see it, in their implementation journeys. So on the far left hand side, you see the strategy and assessment. That means, what is it for me? What does the standard mean? You're in the, you're in the start of phase. But towards the end, you can see you're ready to go. It's business as usual. As you can see from the snake, and we will come back to this one for each Nordic uh, territory, we have uh, someone who's not yet uh, started, but also quite a few has progressed quite far on their implementation journey. Moving on to what we see in Norway. So the current regulation for insurance companies in Norway is based on the EEA agreement. We have IFRS for listed companies, but for uh, local statutory purposes and standalone financial statements, we have local regulation. This local regulation, that's based on IFRS. That means uh, recognition and measurement principles are IFRS, whilst disclosure requirements is Norwegian GAP. A few years, no, a few months, a few weeks ago, uh, the Norwegian FSA sent their uh, draft regulations on IFRS 17 impl application to the Ministry of Finance. In their proposal, it actually says that in the standalone financial statements for P and C insurers, it's a requirement for large insurance entities, i.e., those who are listed or part of an IFRS reporting group, to apply IFRS 17 in the standalone financial statements. But there's also an option for smaller and medium sized entities to apply IFR 17. But for life insurers, it's prohibited to apply IFR 17. That means uh, in the standalone stand financial statements, you cannot adopt IFR 17. So if you're a life player, you have to prepare two sets of financial statements in addition to the Solvency 2. The draft regulation is also silent on the knock-on consequences. So what will happen with tax and so on is yet to be um, decided. Before I hand over to uh, my Swedish colleague, uh, I will uh, just um, let you know that we have Norwegian insurers who are all over the snake, the same as we see in the Nordic perspective. In Sweden, we have Alexander Dolhoff. He is an IFR 17 uh, expert working on quite a few IFR 17 projects, and he will be able to provide you with some insights on what's going on in Sweden. So, Alexander, where are the Swedish insurers? Thanks, Lars Christian, and good morning to everyone. Here comes the contribution from Sweden. You see, this show is a bit inspired by the recent European Song Contest. It's just a bit less of song and a bit more of accounting. I hope you will like that. Um, yeah, here in Sweden um, also, it, the same applies than, than for Norway, that consolidated financial statements of listed entities are to pre be prepared in accordance with uh, international accounting standards. Um, that is what we call full IFRS. And from 2023, so the European in Union endorses IFR 17, also IFR 17 will be part of these full, this full IFRS set of standards. Um, then let's look at the statutory accounts. Here we have in Sweden a framework that combines some uh, local legislation with full IFRS. It's called law restricted IFRS. Um, and that works as follows that you are supposed to use full IFRSs as long as they are not contrary to law and regulations. And such law and regulations, um, when it comes to the accounting of insurance contracts, to a large extent reflect the content of a 1991 EU directive. For example, that directive prescribes the format of the income statement and balance sheet to be used, and that has been translated into our 
law and regulation. And there are also a couple of other items that have been taken over um, uh, on valuation of liabilities and um, other matters. So that is the upper layer, but from 2023, the lower layer, the bottom layer, there will be IFRS 17. And there is the interesting question of how much of IFRS 17 actually is in line with law and regulations. Um, two years ago, approximately, the FSA has held a number of uh, discussion sessions with the industry and other um, stakeholders. And following these discussions, they have then concluded informally at that point in time that only a minor part of IFRS 17 is in line with existing laws and regulations, but what exactly we don't know, so that we are all a bit waiting for uh, with interest. Now, the next steps of the FSA will be to uh, publish a timeline for their upcoming work because there will be some regulatory changes that need to happen and that uh, the timeline is expected after the summer. Um, for them, it is important uh, that any new draft of such a new regulation for public comment can first be published after the EU has endorsed IFRS 17. And that's a topic that we will come back to at a later uh, section of this, uh, this roadshow. Um, then let's look briefly at consolidated statements of non-listed insurers. So for the listed insurers, we have full IFRS. Um, that's clear, but what, how, what happens to uh, non-listed insurers? And there the situation is um, that last year we got a change in the regulation. Historically, we also have had full IFRS there. Um, Last year, the FSA then uh, uh, decided that we will that we have an option. Insurers, such insurers, have an option to choose between using full IFRS on the one side or a, a framework that is now referred to law restricted uh, group accounting. So that is pretty close to uh, our law restricted uh, IFRS for statutory accounting. And I would expect that probably many of the insurers will choose this law-restricted group accounting regime for their consolidated accounts if they are non-listed. Yeah, then let's look briefly at the snake when it comes to the implementation preparations here in Sweden. We see quite a wide span amongst Swedish companies. Uh, a few, one or two, are quite advanced. They are uh, getting into, they have uh, large parts of their system infrastructure and the data ready and getting then more into parallel runs um, and then of course approaching a transition date uh, at the end of the year. Then there are two or three in the middle of constructing and testing their system environments and definitely also doing a couple of test runs of parts of that structure. Uh, but the remainder of companies, uh, I would say, have definitely performed some preparatory activities and some have also chosen a software provider, um, but they are still in the detailed design phase or even earlier. So this was the first contribution here from Sweden. So with that, over to you, Marco, in Finland. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Uh, regarding the Finnish market, so IFR 17 will be, uh, will be, will be, uh, implemented within the listed companies only and the companies uh, who has already been reporting under the IFRS, IFRS standard. And, uh, and, and, and within these words, there, are, there is not coming any new companies who would have a need to convert the local gap to IFRS 17 due to the new standard what is coming, coming, coming after, after several, uh, some months. Uh, in Finland, we have ten companies all together who will be uh, or that needs to be uh, report under the IFRS standard. And and when comparing this number for under the Nord, uh, Nordic territories, so that is not so big one. So within the Nordic market, we are the smallest one. When looking at the uh, preparation of the standard itself within the within the in series, so uh, the biggest the biggest institutions. They have been started the preparations uh, on the mid uh, 2018. So there has been going on 
for three years the projects, and there has been coming up uh, many new many new topics uh, within the standard itself. Uh, when looking at the mid-sized companies and the small ones, uh, I can say that those those organizations they have had the projects uh, up and running. Uh, so uh, I can uh, close to close to close to six months to one year. So uh, due to the, due to the postponing of the standard itself, so the clients has also been postponing uh, the start of the uh, preparations. Uh, that means that uh, when when going for the details of the standard itself, so it seems to be so that uh, the the timeline to prepare for the standard can be a little bit uh, challenging. Uh, some issues what we have seen within the within the engagement in in uh, also in Finland also in Nordics. Uh, is is uh, interpretations of the standard itself. As we know, the standard is not so uh, deeply described, and it gives it gives room uh, for the interpre interpretations, and 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 uh, that will that is a challenging part. Uh, some topics what we where, where we are having uh, many discussions is that okay, what are the participants uh, participating contracts? Uh, what kind of measurements, measurements model should be used, and as we know, the CM is uh, totally a new element. Uh, another issue or, or challenge what we have been seeing uh, within the within the modeling of the financial impact is the uh, lack of lack of quality of data, and uh, also uh, what what uh, the client should be doing within the uh, IFRS 17 engines. Uh, Quite many smaller institutions are planning to build up the system by themselves. Or as we understand, it will bring uh, some uh, or different 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 challenges uh, compared uh, for taking uh, any 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 uh, third party solution. And the final final topic, what I was to say is that or tell is that when going further within the standard and preparation, so the KPIs are within very important role because. The better transparency and comparability of the financial week figures uh, will have an effect for the equity or investor story. Uh, what what the company needs to tell for the market and the investors. So, within these words, I'm I'm willing to give up the word for my colleague Jette in Denmark. Please, Jette. Thank you very much, Marco. Yeah. So, Denmark, we are. At the end of this uh, Nordic presentation, when we look at Solvency 2, we really were the first movers. But concerning IFA 17, we has been very slow starters, both in the industry and also in the FSA. IFA 17 is only for listed companies in Denmark, like you have heard in the other Nordic countries. But due to the uncertainty, a lot of companies not being listed had to use some effort in getting into the standard. For actually, there are only five companies in Denmark who is uh, applied to implement IFA 17. So what about the local uh, accounting standard? In Denmark, we have implemented a Solvency 2 similar accounting standard at the moment, and it's still unknown what the local accounting standard are going to be if we are going to implement IFA 17 similarity. The work around the accounting standard has been a cooperation between the industry and the FSA, and the work will be delayed because the accounting expert at the Danish FSA has retired. And what have the discussion been? Up to now, it has been if we should implement a mix uh, between Solvency 2 standard and the IFA 17 standard as the local accounting standard. So that's really up in the air where we are going to end. Um, and for the life insurance companies in Denmark, there are some issues making the implementation a bit harder um, because we are obliged to implement stochastic calculations for the Solvency 2 technical provisions, uh, which you know there are some options and guarantees in that. And also there are some work about the new legislation called contribution rules, which can also 
have a complication for the IFS 17 project. So when you look at this lake, we are not so far as the other, but the, it's also only few companies in Denmark who is going to implement IFS 17. So that was that. So over to you, Lars. Thank you, Jette, uh, Alexander and Marco for bringing the insights on the Nordic uh, perspective. It's fair to say that we have uh, a mixed landscape here in the Nordics regarding this. I also want to apologize for the sound issues that we had uh, regarding one of the uh, speakers, but uh, we're working on that one and we'll try to uh, avoid that one uh, going forward as well. But we're honored here to have the global IFR 17 leader with us to bring some insights from a global perspective. Some of you have already met Alex Bertolotti in London a few years ago at an event, but things have moved on since 2018 when you saw him. We have some other considerations now than then. But before we hand over to Alex, I would like to remind you that it's an option to ask questions. Uh, I see that it works given the feedback on the sound. So uh, Alex, in um, a global perspective, what are we seeing? What's the for 7 landscape like? Thank you. Thank you, Lars. And um, I'm not sure I like these the references to the Eurovision with um, the UK ending up with zero points at the weekend. So thank you, Alexander, for, for taking us down that path. And Lars, you're, you're absolutely right. I do remember talking to a number of people here um, three years ago. I can picture it right now. And... Um, I guess at that point, I personally was in two years into this IFRS 17 journey. I started my role back in 2016. We're five years in now and nearly there. I think we've titled this uh, The Roadshow, It's Time to Accelerate. And it does feel like it, it's now time to accelerate. And I'll, I'll explain a bit more. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, I don't have many slides to talk through, but this is a summary from PwC perspective of some of the, the big highlights. I mean, for us, we have 3,200 plus staff now engaged on IFRS 17 projects globally. We've got over 250 projects live. Um, it impacts a number of territories and a number of insurance companies. And is a big thing, actually. I remember starting off and people saying, you know, is it going to be, you know, a quarter of the size of Solvency 2 or half the size? I, I think it's bigger, actually. And I think it's bigger because insurance companies have to, I guess, fix years of underinvestment in IT and data and processes in order to comply with this standard. And so as soon as you open the bonnet, there's more and more things that you need to fix. And we're seeing that through a number of our projects. Just a couple of um, points to, to raise on top of that from this slide. One is, um, as a firm, we, and I think Alwyn is talking a bit later, we do a knowledge share across our top 30 clients every six weeks, talking about what are the issues, how the budgets, what's working, what's not working. Um, and we keep that really up to date. It's a really good thing, really powerful thing. And we use that to inform the two or three slides that you're going to see here. So. This is relatively recent. I think two weeks ago was the last one we did. And it shows the issues coming up from our top 30 clients. Um, another thing from this slide, it takes a long time to complete one of these projects. And some of the bigger clients are getting to the end of the completion journey, but it takes a long time. There is a lot to do. We've put 33 months in here. I think for our smaller clients, it will be less. Um, but please don't underestimate the amount of time that you need to, 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 to comply with IFRS 70. Uh, and then the only other thing from here is it's costly. The good news, I think, for those that are starting now is that there's a lot of lessons to be learned from projects that have gone before you. So please do you know, reach out to, to the team and, and ask to plug into what are those lessons. Um, but for a number of reasons, some of these budgets have have really gone through the roof, changing software providers, um, pausing projects, not setting it up properly. So please do, do learn those lessons. Um, next slide, please. So this is the, the global snake. It was very interesting, interesting to see the, the local talk about that 
uh, in a second. So the snake itself, this is, it's actually the, the River Thames. Um, strangely, I inherited this when I took on this role five years ago. But it's a really good depiction all the way through from impact assessment, all the way through construct and test, parallel run, transition, um, to get to the end of an IFRS 17 project. And we track where our clients are on that. We've also highlighted on here whether people have done um, IFRS 17 standalone and whether they've looked to do finance transformation. We did think at the start of this that everyone would use IFRS 17 to embark on a journey of finance transformation. And a lot of people thought about it and then put a budget together and then the CFO said no because it costs too much. What we're finding though is that as people continue on those projects, they are doing an element of finance transformation, changing systems, build data warehouse, uh, fixed processes, whatever it might be, as you go through the IFRS 17 project. Um, and just to talk about this slide, you can group it into three buckets. On the right-hand side, you have a number of our larger companies headed up, and Florian will be happy, by the Germans and the Swiss and the South Africans that are really getting towards the end of their projects, thinking about KPIs, thinking about what to release into the market, and finalizing accounting policy choices. There is another chunk at the top of that, that first hump, detailed design, which are right in the middle of those projects. And there's less now, um, but some still at the start of that journey. Now, it's worth realizing that this is for the, the largest global companies. If you drop down a level in the UK, for example, the majority of our companies are on the left-hand side of this chart. If you look around the world in some of the smaller territories, a number of companies haven't started yet, which is a bit worrying given there's not a lot of time to, to implement IFRS 17. So a big concern I would have is where are the people going to be? Where are you gonna get the people from and the resources from to implement this really complicated standard in a really short time frame. So, you know, we titled this, it's time to accelerate. I really think, uh, I really think it is. Um, and if you, I guess, final comment on here, looking at where um, your market is, it does seem looking at the charts actually that you're more progressed than I thought you would be compared to the rest of the world. So I think it was Lars who said that, um, you know, the delay had happened, or was it a market that delay had happened and therefore clients stopped. Looking at the progress along that snake, you are in a better place than I thought you would be compared to, to the rest of the world. Um, if you just go to the next slide, please. So there is a lot on this slide, but it is incredibly rich. This is, you know, we've kept it up to date now for, for years. This is the the current issues which our clients are facing in implementing IFRS 17. Um, we call it the flower chart. It's sort of morphed into more of a football. Um, but we it basically is one of the issues and we rank them alongside systems, technical, reporting, organization, processes, and data. And I know Andrea is going to be talking and Alwyn's going to be talking in a while, but let me bring a couple of um, a couple of these points out to you. And if you start, I guess, top left on systems, and I'm not going to steal that one's thunder, um, but one thing that has really jumped out to me is how not ready the vendors are for IFRS 17 around their CSM solutions and the integration of CSM with, with general ledgers. Um, we've had a number of clients switch vendor over the past couple of years as what they thought they bought wasn't ready yet or didn't work or wasn't compatible. And that to me has been a big jump out from the, the systems element of here. <clears throat> from a technical perspective, um, Andrea will talk later. I guess the big question is, will there be a carve out in the EU for annual cohorts? Um, and the second point here, as an audit partner, as is Lars, um, it feels like the rubber is hitting the road for accounting policy decision make uh, choices. So, you know, if you look at the next box down, interaction with external auditors, we're seeing proper decisions having to be made now by the big audit firms and by clients 
over difficult technical decisions, ones which have a real impact on business. Um, so I would definitely recommend you interact with your auditors sooner rather than later and then nail them down to a decision because they won't want to give you bad news as your clients. So nail them down. Um, we're very connected globally with the other audit firms and also with us. So we know where people are. We know where our clients are. So please do, uh, I guess, reach out quickly on that. A couple of other points down uh, bottom left on reporting. Um, you know, we mentioned KPIs. That is the hot topic of choice at the moment. We've done as a firm two investors analyst events over the past two weeks at their request. Um, as analysts, investors and rating agencies now start to wake up to what is IFRS 17 and the impact it might have. Um, we're not expecting firms to be issuing IFRS 17 numbers until probably Q3 2022, so end of next year. Um, but that's an interesting topic. What are the KPIs? What are people going to produce? When are they going to produce them? And what's the impact that's going to have on the story they tell to the market about their company? Um, other areas down here, taxation. Tax authorities seem to be asleep uh, and not realizing, well, asleep is probably the wrong word, as they've got other things to worry about, but not realizing the impact that this will have on profit and potentially taxable profit. So again, we're encouraging people to, to talk to their, their tax authorities and try and get on the front foot. Um, and regulators as well. I mean, it's interesting to hear that your regulator is definitely taking an interest. There are some around the world that are very proactive, demanding things from companies around impact assessments and reporting progress. Um, there are others that are doing nothing. So again, to the extent your regulator is not yet involved, please, I'd, I'd recommend you reach out and try and talk to them and get them engaged. Um, on the right-hand side of the chart around data, you know, we've often said this is a data standard rather than um, an accounting standard from an implementation perspective. By far the biggest issue has been trying to get hold of data. Um, and by far the biggest opportunity is how to grab that data, fix it, and then derive some value from it for the business. Um, and nobody's really succeeded in that. And I think a lot of people want to, but that to me is probably two, three years hence. Once the standard is in, companies are over the line, they start to look at what value they can get. Under processes, um, two points here. One is, I guess, around handoffs. Um, you know, what do actuaries do? What do accountants do? Um, who talks to who? When do they talk to each other? What are the handoffs? That's proving to be trickier than we had thought. The other is around documentation and testing. And if you look at some of the advanced programs, that has taken longer than we thought it was going to take. So just to flag to you that they are, it looks easy, but um, they are probably chunkier than you would think. And with my 20 seconds to go, bottom right, training. Um, who do you train? When do you train them? Change management. It's a big change for organizations and people. Um, please don't forget change management. And then staff retention, motivation, and delay. Um, these are big projects. They're complicated projects. There's not many people who know what they're doing. And there's a lot of companies that need to implement IFRS 17. And we're starting to see around the world the job market picking up for people who do know what they're talking about. So you know, again, thinking about your staff, how do you keep them? You don't want to lose them in, in six months' time when you're in the middle of your project. Um, let me just check if I've got one more slide. Next slide, please. And again. Next slide. Next slide. Brilliant. So that was all I wanted to say. I think there will be no further delay in IFRS 17. It's coming. It's time to accelerate. And um, I wish I could see you all. I really enjoyed the, the meeting we had three years ago. So um, thank you very much, Lars. And either back to you or back to Alexandra. OK, thank you, Alex. Um, we actually, um, I, I believe that your message um, came through because we got a question for you. Uh, and that was um, related to the uh, projects, project planning, and so on. So, 
Uh, what are the key learning points for those who are about to finalize their IFR 17 journeys that those who are in the startup phase can can consider if you have a mi minute to spare on that one? Yeah, I do. Um, and I don't know whether Alwyn's on or not because Alwyn's got um, got some really good thoughts on this. So perhaps if I talk, maybe Alwyn can contribute. Um, I think it's important to start with who's sponsoring, what's the governance, and what are you trying to achieve from this project? Um, I think a lot of people, at least at the start, give this to the technical team, the accountants, or give it to the actuaries and say, go and make IFRS 17 happen. And then it goes along the lines of, well, we can, we need some extra resource. We can resource it through contractors or we can do it ourselves. And it never works. It never works. So setting the project to up to succeed with decent governance, ensuring that you've got the right people and the right bandwidth to implement, do those two things, and that will really help you. But it'll help you not lose a lot of time and spend a lot of cost. Um, I don't know, Alwyn, if you're, if you're on, if you wanted to comment. I think uh, Alex will, will, will park that one and pick up with Alvin yeah, afterwards yeah. Uh, as well. But thank you for thank you for joining. Uh, good good presentation, and uh, speak to you soon. Thank you. So um, our next agenda point is uh, something that has caught a lot of attention uh, over the last uh, few years. Uh, when I worked in the UK, I followed the uh, discussion in EFRAG uh, in details, and I must say that uh, following this one was quite interesting. Uh, working globally, I also observed that the EU endorsement process attracted a lot of attention um, from other non-EU um, territories. So, uh, Alexander, uh, being at the uh, EFRAG Insurance Accounting Working Group, I believe that you might have some uh, insights on how the EU process has been uh, to date. Yeah. Let's um, talk a bit through the political political process. Um, so uh, just maybe as a bit of a reminder before any new IFRS standard um, is eligible for use in the European Union, it needs to be endorsed and endorsed means it needs to be approved for use in the European Union. So it's not just so that if the ISB issues a standard, it, it will automatically apply in the European Union, but it needs to be approved for use. And this process is performed under the umbrella of the European Commission. <coughs> And as a first step, the Commission writes a letter to an expert organization to provide feedback on whether this is a good standard. That expert organization is, we have heard the name a couple of times now, is called EFRAG. Um, and EFRAG has now worked a number of years on this. Um, they had a lot of own discussions in own forums, but also conducted diverse outreach activities in respect of IFRS 17. And just a couple of weeks ago, they sent their advice letter to the European Commission from Brussels to Brussels. Um, so here you see a co copy of the of the letter on the right hand side. And now, of course, very interesting to see what has EFRAG <laughs> written to the Commission. Um, so the first main statement is that they then concluded that uh, all the requirements, except for one, they think that IFRA 17 is a very good standard. It meets the qualitative characteristics where they looked at relevance, reliability, comparability, and understandability. And it's also conductive to the European public good. So, for example, in competitive situations. So that is fine. So the only thing is that one area where they didn't couldn't make up their mind on, and that is to do with the uh, annual cohorts requirement. The annual cohorts requirement relates to the requirements of IFRS 17 to aggregate contracts into groups in order to achieve a certain profit pattern, a specific profit pattern that the ISP wants to have. And this will work for a number of products, but for some types of products in particular, where cash flows of one generation or cohort interact or uh, are linked to con uh, cash flows of other generations, this is difficult to do without too much arbitrariness. And the industry has for a long time now, and other observers as well, pushed for that we need to get this solved. The ISB has thought long and hard about it themselves also, whether they could make further amendments, but always concluded, no, we can't. And therefore, there is still an annual cohort requirement in the current IFRS 17 standard. So 
EFRAG concluded not on that question, but they were split actually in the board about whether this is good enough to go anyway or whether we need to have a change. Um, so with that, maybe next slide, we can look at how the process will uh, continue. So now that the letter is uh, at the other end of Brussels at the European Commission, so now the European Commission is working on this and um, their target is then to submit a draft regulation to a, a subcommittee, which is called the Accounting Regulatory Committee that consists of, of participants from finance departments of different member states. So it is now a political <laughs> a decision there to come up. And and they so every IFRS standard will be translated into an implementing technical standard. So the draft of that implementing technical standard, the European Commission will submit to the ARC, and the ARC then will vote on this. And the big big question now, the elephant in the room is, what will they do with the annual cohorts? Will they issue a sort of so-called carving? that they change IFR 17 on, on particular points um, so that there is a specific European version of it, or will they go with the full IFR uh, 17? And if they make such a carving, the other question is, will this be a mandatory carving? So you always need to do it in the European Union according to what the commission is then describing, or do you have the possibility to anyway also apply the the full, the, 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 the true IFRS 17 as issued by the ISB. Um, and I think many preparers I have heard would prefer such an option, in particular if they have business also across the world. There might be maybe some business in Australia where they do the full IFRS or in Japan and they don't want to have differences then to what they need to do in Europe. Um, so once the ARC then has given a positive vote, uh, it goes uh, further to the European Parliament and the Council where we, who will have a three-month scrutiny period. So if they are, don't have any hiccups or um, issues with the proposal, it will then go through and then the Commission will publish the final regulation in the official journal of the European Union. And that is then, then it is officially uh, endorsed in in Europe with this act of publication. So now, of course, very interesting, will this, will this be, will, will the institutions be able to do this in the remainder of the year? We know that next year is the comparative period if we want to um, get into IFRS 17, 2023. So transition date is 1st of January coming year, comparative period 2022. So it is important to have that certainty by the end of the year, but also a few insurers have said, we would like to apply IFRS 17 early. Um, and uh, for them, of course, they only can do this if it, is, if it is endorsed. So everyone wants to have this process going smoothly now and not causing any further delay. And I think uh, I, what I have heard is that all are committed to this, but we need to see what the political process is, is doing. Yes, then um, lastly, I also wanted uh, to point to two other things that will obviously happen. The one is that, that uh, despite when the exact endorsement will be, companies will be as part of their IS8 disclosures need to portray the impact of IFRS 17 already in their financial statements end of this year and 2022 then again. Um, so that is already a requirement that is in place. And maybe also just mentioning that there is an ISB meeting today um, where they have on the agenda insurance contracts, um, the insurance contracts project, and the ISB is discussing to make, to potentially go into a, a small process to amend additionally IFRS 17 for one, for one topic, and that is a narrow scope amendment on, on uh, accounting for derecognized assets um, when an insurer first applies IFRS 17. So a number of insurers has mentioned that there is a is a major issue with this um, for derecognized assets that have been derecognized um, when you go over to uh, IFRS 17 in 2023. This has to do with IFRS 9 as well. And 
And the ISB is now considering to do a narrow scope amendment and they will decide on whether or not they should do this today, as I understand. But we should not expect that they will open up entirely IFRS 17 again. This is just a t very targeted amendment. And I, I would expect if it comes, it will go very quick as to processing in the due process of the ISB, and then it needs to go through the due process in EFRAC and the Commission as well. So it needs to take the same route then then the main standard has taken and hopefully also conclude that by the end of, of the year. So this was the brief update on the political process. With that, back to you, Lars, in the studio. Thank you, Alexander. Um, we've actually got a few questions uh, on this one, but a bit cautious of time. Um, we'll try to um, park those when and pick them up uh, towards the end. Um, but... Um, on the next agenda, we will. Uh, you started to touch on it, uh, some interpretation issues and some practical challenge that's challenges that we do see. So, um, as we also alluded to and I uh, referenced before, I, I believe that the technical issues and what we see is starting to get more detailed uh, than we did before. But there are still uh, some issues uh, or interpretation issues hanging up there uh, that we see globally, and we try to draw the parallel to what we see locally here as well. So, uh, Jette uh, and Alexander, uh, you will give us some insights on what uh, we see globally and locally. Uh, so, uh, Jette, uh, perhaps you can start with the global perspective before you hand over to Alex and give him the local perspective as well. Thank you very much, Lars. Yes, I will. At PwC, we have a Nordic as well as a global network of accountants and actuaries who are working together to help interpret IFA 70s issue, as you heard Alex talked about, and what are arising from insurers implementation programs as we see it at the moment. At this slide, you can see some of the themes. There are a lot of areas requiring adjustment, as you know, and as well as the need to think about eligibility criteria or choices in the standard. A lot of insurance are having concerns about how they should be dealing with the uncertainty around these interpretations. You can also see them at the right side at the hot topics, which has, of course, an effect on both the systems in the implementations and the projects at, at the same time. And also the problem about how to focus on materiality uh, would be applied and as well of the degree of documentation needed for these implementation decisions. So this uncertainty is really an issue. Analysts, as you heard Alex talk about earlier, are also beginning to show an interest in what IFS 17 will show. So we are seeing more questions around presentations and disclosure and particularly the revenue. A lot of our discussions are also focused about uh, the practical challenges which are associated to this IFA 17 implementation, particularly in areas like the data quality, the accessibility to the data, and also the resources, all as you have heard earlier today. What we also experience is that there are some system developers who are doing one thing where the accountants and the actuaries might think that IFA 17 requires something slightly different. Uh, so moving to the hot topics uh, at the right side, uh, what is addressed there? Uh, that is uh, the most recently the discussions we are having. And a number of these relate to the areas where the standard has changed. For example, the impairment of asset recognized by acquisition cost, where we now have the two tests, one against the cash flow for each renewal group and one against the totality, and also the loss recovery compon component uh, on reinsurance contract held. Uh, but some of the others are more closely associated with the detailed mechanism of applying the standard, you know, such as treatment of financial risk under the general model, and the use of coverage unit. Um, so on top of all that, uh, as you can see at the bottom, uh, you still need to be careful not to lose sight of IFS 9, which are also coming. A number, we have seen that a number of, of insurance are applying the general model and they rely on the assumption that that would be relatively straightforward if they don't elect to use the OCI option. And therefore they expect that 
all of the asset to be held at a fair value to profit loss. But this can also create mismatches where changes in some financial risk are recognized in the CSM uh, under the VFA model. So that is an area where insurance needs to be prepared. So over to you, Alex, what do you see in the local market? Yeah, great, Jette, thanks. Um, uh, when you talk through these international topics, I mean, there are already a number of them, which we definitely have ongoing discussions here in, in the Nordic markets uh, about. I can definitely underwrite EFA eligibility is something that comes up uh, in different territories as to which contracts are eligible for that and how the test is to be performed. Maybe the requirements in the standard are not the most clear, <laughs> clearly worded ones. Um, so the interpretation is very unclear and we also have seen changes in the recent uh, amendments in that respect. Uh, then derivation of investment components, non-distinct investment components is discussed and acquisition cost is currently a very hot topic in different forms. Um, the prepaid acquisition cost asset, but likewise also the adjustments to the, uh, to revenue and insurance service expenses for acquisition costs and what constitutes an acquisition cost. And the coverage unit, maybe not yet so much discussed here yet because it comes up when you do the numbers and the coverage units very much will depend what profit you will show in the future and the profit patterns. And when you, once you have your systems up and running and you can do these calculations, you will discover different type of effects like the international industry with the bow wave effect. I don't think our companies are fully there yet, but um, this will definitely be an issue. So to complement these, these general issues that we observe in, in uh, more globally, I would also like to add some specific Nordic issues. Um, the first one relates to the contract unit that is used to perform the accounting. Usually under IFRS 17, um, you, it is the contract that is the, the legal contract that is the the basis for accounting but in some situations um, it might be more appropriate to consciously deviate from this and use a, a sub part of the contract to uh, for the accounting uh, in other situations the legal contract might be quite um, difficult constructed with different uh, parties involved and you will need to decide what is actually our accounting contract unit and that is that contract unit discussion is uh, very much alive and for some of the products. In particular, I think here about group and collective pension schemes or also risk contracts where we have, for example, employers and employees, and you need to think what is now the, the contract. Definitely a question discussed in Norway also for the Norwegian defined benefit plan. So I understand the solution is near or has been now also uh, is, 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 is to be found, uh, but, but definitely it has been discussed a lot. And uh, in other territories, it is still discussed a lot. Then the next point is then separation of certain contract components. Um, for example, when it comes to in Finland, we have uh, savings contracts where policyholders can choose to invest both in a traditional part and a unit link part. That is a discussion that, that has uh, come up on whether this is then actually two contracts or one. But also in Sweden and Norway, it's the separation of waiver of premium and sickness riders from a pension contract. And, and it, this is definitely also a question of separation of riders in other territories. But there we, we feel that the companies have have concluded and, and probably got around to that they are not separating. Uh, the discussion is still alive in Sweden and Norway. Uh, but I also want to mention that it's very important that we need to look at the details of the contract and the products that we talk about. So it might be that maybe for some of the Norwegian contracts, it will be possible to do this. We will need to see where we end up for the Swedish ones. Um, yes, and maybe the last, the last topic for... Um, particularly Sweden and Norway, that is of interest is classification of uh, unit link contracts um, with inheritance gains, uh, where also the company has a possibility to regularly freely reprise these contracts. That is maybe the specificity we see in, the, in these two countries compared to other international territories, that there is this freely reprising possibility. And and how should should these be part of IFRS 17 or are, is that more an investment contract to be accounted for under IFRS 9 and IFRS 15? Um, this has been a very hot topic for a long time. I think we are progressing 
with this towards a possible solution. Um, not yet 100% there, but I think it's going into the right direction. So um, that is still a bit on the agenda, but I would hope that until the summer, we will have a, a clearer picture on, on that one. So with this, uh, back to Lars Christian. Thank you, Alexander uh, and Jette. Uh, there are some interesting uh, topics to be resolved or discussed in the near future, I, I guess. Um, we didn't get any questions regarding this section, uh, but if you have any technical interpretation questions and so on, please uh, reach out to one of, your, uh, one of my colleagues in the Nordic territories and we will be uh, able to assist you uh, on those one too. But uh, discussing the technical interpretation issues, uh, I believe the next uh, um, agenda item is also um, key. How to involve your audit, how to prepare for a su successful audit of IFR 17, your IFR 17 journey. So based on experience from other projects, we have some key considerations as auditors when it comes to our involvement in an implementation project like IFR 17. And we're also uh, trying to br bring uh, the network together to have one approach to audit uh, and consider um, consistent application of the standard. So uh, from Sweden, we have our Swedish insurance leader who will uh, give some local insights, but also uh, our global IFR 17 audit leader, um, Florian Muller, will provide some insights on how we work within the network. So Morgan, perhaps you can provide us with some provide the audience with some insights on what our audit teams are thinking about when it comes to implementing IFR 17 sure let's get down uh, how to prepare for a successful audit I think that's that's a great subject but also a huge challenge to take on for the next I think we have 16 minutes or so to get there I tried to visualize for myself year 2024 what would the success how would successful success look like in this respect uh, i guess the definition of success it uh, it uh, it probably vary uh, among us and uh, we probably have the at least as many answers as we are on this call or, or this session. But when I try to visualize myself, uh, how it would look like uh, the success, I come up with three areas. The first one is quality. The second one is a structured process. And the third one is a reasonable cost constraint for both, both us as well as our clients. Uh, if we start by the quality, I, I think, we should reflect a bit about quality or what would poor quality be. Lack of quality from my perspective will ultimately be restatement coming through in 2024 and forward. Good quality instead, it will for me be that we focus on key areas uh, in a timely manner and get the main consideration sorted out well in advance of the year 2023. This was also include that internal control components uh, are reviewed and, and commented on in a timely manner. So, so you have the right control uh, in place before implementation of the standard 2023. The second one, structured process. For me, that would be that they are robust audit plan that are clearly aligned with the project plan within the company we audit. Uh, this makes us be able to focus on the right things and uh, be able also to close things on the way so, don't, so we don't have too many open items ongoing. The third area, reasonable cost. I think that if we have the right quality and a structured approach, I'm convinced that we collectively will reduce our unnecessary cost uh, on, on the project. However, implementation of the standard, as we discussed before on this session, it will take a lot of time and effort. Uh, but if we together manage to succeed in these three areas, 
I'm I'm certain that uh, this will strengthen our our uh, relationships going further. As Lars Christian said, my name is Morgan Sandström. I'm insurance leader at, and audit partner at PwC Sweden. I'm delighted to have Florian Möller uh, with me today, who's our global IFRS 17 audit leader, as well as an, an audit partner. Uh, I hope that you all heard about the concept of proactive assurance. We have talked about it with our audit clients and, and uh, uh, use not audit clients of PwC. I guess you have discussed it with your auditors. Uh, however, the concept is meaning doing the audit up front and, and, let, and not wait until year 2023. Uh, and why should proactive assurance be important in this success? I think it's it's one is a concept that will avoid late surprises if you consult and discuss with your auditors in timely manner so we have the same sort of understanding of the key topics. It also gives the right perspective on most relevant topics, get you know, early assurance and not building system and processes that need to be changed if we don't agree about accounting treatment. Uh, and it also, it's, I must say, it should be an effective use of resources. Uh, it should be more efficient to use our resources immediately rather than later in the process. Uh, as you see on this page, you can, you can find this snake or the Thames, as Alex mentioned again. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a uh, picture about global audit progression regarding IFRS 17. Uh, in the Nordics, uh, we're working with a number of clients already and uh, are in a startup phase in some cases. For some clients, we, we have regular meetings uh, to discuss and conclude on interpretation. But I think it's important to highlight that the audit will follow the company's own progression. So we're a bit behind uh, the progression that was um, shown before on this session. Here in the Nordics, we experienced that we are in the yellow phase to the left uh, that we call concept and methodology with focus on interpretation. Uh, I think that most of our clients' uh, contacts in respect of IFRS 17 audits, it's on discussion basis where we discuss different accounting interpretation. But I see that we're starting to get into the more written accounting paper phase, so to call it, uh, where we can conclude on it. And I, I think where we don't uh, are in that phase, it's important to get there very soon. Uh, I was thinking, Florian, uh, what's your global perspective on, on this uh, progress? Um, global uh, IFRS 17 uh, audit insurance leader here and, and really great pleasure to, to, to share here my, my global view on the progression and how, how uh, you could uh, get involved with your audit teams uh, to accelerate uh, the auditor engagement, auditor involvement. And it's also great pressure from my side, as I am, you can see, I come to you here from my home office still because of COVID situation here in Germany. And, and But I live only 80 kilometers south of the Danish border, so I'm very close to the Nordic states here. Therefore, again, great pleasure. And just on the Eurovision context uh, um, topic at the beginning, um, Alexander, I think you mentioned that now. I think it, it, Germany, that, that was really a poor performance. <laughs> but the only good takeaway um, here, and this is adding to, to Alex Bertolotti's comments here as well, uh, is that we were a second last one position ahead of, of the UK here. I think that was the good takeaway from our side here. No, it's just, just kidding. Yeah, with regard to, to the pro progression, I think it's, it's um, uh, as you said, the, the yellow stage is, is, is also from a global perspective, the, 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 the stage where we do see many of our clients uh, or the, our audit teams um, um, with regard to the involvement. But this should not relax uh, uh, ourselves and, 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 and you as, as, as uh, uh, insurers. 
um, because we do see a critical path to meet uh, the deadlines in 2023. And um, within this early stage here, um, this first phase of of the progression, um, I think we are good on track, but we must keep uh, the speed going forward, um, especially if you keep in mind how many time and effort is already uh, invested in, in the IFS 17 implementations. Um, you, you should also be careful of, of the time Then the auditor needs to have a look uh, uh, at those uh, numbers produced, uh, new processes implemented, the data uh, um, uh, households, for example. And there are many things we, we, we have on, on our next slide and we want to share with you as well. So I think it's, it's a perfect timing at the moment uh, to accelerate uh, the, the involvement with, with the auditor. And yeah, having said this, back to you, Morgan. Yeah. Now we can next page, please. Yeah, and this this page it represents basically the the main areas that we are considering as audit teams, uh, and and we bucket them into this flower uh, divided into technical parts. We have system and data uh, processes and control, and and finally we have also the reporting part. Uh, if I start with with uh, the technical area, I think think one of some of the the, the main uh, things that on the radar, it's the transition, of course. Yeah, the choice that will be made will obviously have a huge impact going forward on the PNL and balance sheet as well. So so that's that's a, a key area for consideration. Another one is the unit link business that we have especially here in Sweden, the classification as well as Norway. Classification, measurement, and Alexander mentioned the separation. That, that, that's something that we need to get into uh, and conclude on. Regarding uh, VFA and PAA, uh, liability, that, that's another area, of course, that, that's, that's on the radar. We discussed it right now and, and try to, to make sure that it, it it doesn't give any inconsistency between between the local market here in, in Nordics and, and the rest of the world. And I think the fourth and, and not least area that's a bit complex, it's the materiality concept. Uh, we are a lot of clients discussing accounting treatment that might not be supported 100% by standard, but more from a materiality perspective. And I think it's important here to, to involve us so we have the same uh, view on, on materiality according to IS1 that the company applied to and, and our audit materiality. Uh, regarding system and data, uh, the, other, the other part of the flower, uh, as Alex mentioned, it's, it's really a data standard and not an accounting standard as, as such. Uh, the CIFRS 17. So obvious things that we are thinking about, how our system and calculations checked, how do we get comfortable with data that's been used. I think normal thing that we used to ask our client and, and audit, I think you, you recognize that. How, for example, how uh, reports and calculations are, are actually made. Uh, the third part of the flower, it, it's regarding process and control. And this is something I think that's really important to highlight uh, that involve us in the early stage regarding the control. And, and some things that we are, are considering, how are controls uh, created or designed in order to cover the most critical areas? That could be, for example, CSM release, transition, uh, classification, and monitoring on, on accounting decision, etc. cetera. Uh, there's a lot of, of internal control areas that will be affected and that, that needs to be revised during the, during the implementation. Uh, finally, reporting. As you know, reporting, that's probably one of the favorite subjects as auditors. And, and one of the uh, abilities that, that uh, the companies need to deal with, it could be multi-gap reporting. As mentioned before, uh, for, for many of the, the countries here in Nordics, 
we will have some sort of local IFRS or lagbegränsad IFRS as we call it here in Sweden. Uh, and for example, if you are a company, Swedish company in a European group, uh, when the European group has to uh, comply with IFRS uh, 17, the Swedish subsidiary need to uh, comply with Swedish GAP, and then they might have a Norwegian branch that need to comply with IFRS 17 again, and the materiality level will be uh, different from, from uh, those uh, different kind of levels within the organization. So that will be a, a challenge and something we are, are considering how it will work uh, going forward. And finally, regarding reporting, something that's more urgent, it's, it's regarding uh, presentation before 2023 in accordance with IS 8 on the effects of effects of, of the implementation of, of IFRS 17 and how precise and with what kind of comfort can we can we uh, bring into that kind of statement. Uh, that was the thing I was thinking about in in um, respect of the audit. Florian, do we have any any perspective that you would like to add on this? Yeah, um, just just a few few views or comments from 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 a global perspective. I think what's also important to note now when we th thought about or think about IFRS 17 orders, we should also be aware or keep in mind IFRS 9 as well. Now we do see those projects always going hand in hand. Alexander mentioned IFRS 9 in his presentation earlier too. So if you discuss with uh, your audit teams, uh, then keep in mind uh, IFRS 9 as well. And uh, the relevance of the IFRS 9 standard might be a le might be less significant like IFRS 17, um, but it's it's also a very relevant standard as those goes hand in hand. Um, uh, it makes sense also from an audit perspective to look at this uh, hand in hand and as a as a as a global and 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 or common project. Then so just a last comment from my side, as I see that we the time time is over now from a PwC perspective. I think we are we are well prepared um, uh, for this proactive assurance work. We we set up a global project with a global project team to ensure that that local teams are prepared as well. You know, have have the relevant uh, knowledge, um, uh, the relevant resources uh, available. We 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 set up a, a digitized uh, approach you know, also to to ensure that our uh, audit approach is efficient and looks after your resources um, 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 to, to the benefit of your own processes and to, to, to ensure an, an seamless uh, uh, initial audit of, of IFRS 17. Yeah. So having, having said this, uh, we are a bit over time. Sorry for that and look forward to your questions. Back to you. Thanks. Thank you, um, Morgan and Florian. Um, actually, you said you're slightly behind time, but we're, we have time for a question. Uh, so um, you, you were started to discuss it, think about it, uh, Morgan. But um, what would you consider the, as the first step for those who haven't started engaging their auditors yet? What, how should they proceed and move forward? Uh, I, th I think the first step is really to reach out with to the auditor and and uh, engage them in your project plan. So you have a line there pro process uh, with uh, the project plan actually that, that, uh, that you have in your company. I, I think that's the first step. Yeah, and, and I agree on this. No? That's, it's a, at, at the end, we, we follow your implementation project and, and the first discussion should be about this implementation plan and, and the timing and uh, to define a critical path, as I said at the beginning, uh, to ensure that the initial order uh, will then be in line and and, and provides the, the relevant uh, assurance uh, for 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 you for your own processes internal processes but also for the stakeholders then yeah and we come back there. we come back there to be able to close open items to have like some sort of cost control or have cost control of, over the process implementation so i think that's key areas yeah, thank you guys. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, involve and engage your auditors uh, in the uh, IFRS 17 journey. We will also be able to maybe provide you some feedback on your project as well uh, to whether we 
would be possible to meet the deadline and um, move forward. Uh, no one would like surprises towards the very end where you have to change, for instance, measurements models and so on. Uh, moving on to the next agenda item, uh, and I think it's, uh, as Morgan also um, alluded to, that uh, involving your auditors may also provide you to gain comfort of the system implementations. Uh, and we have also touched on this a few times in the webinar, that access to data and the quality and so on, um, because it's a technical standard as well as a system-driven standard, uh, is uh, important. So uh, fr from the UK, we have the... Um, technology consulting leader, uh, Alvin Sviles, with us. Uh, and um, Alvin work a lot with consulting and IFR 17 projects and so on. But um, you also worked with Solvency 2, if I'm not wrong, uh, Alvin. Do we see if like four, four years into the journey, is it a Solvency 2 uh, implementation uh, all over again with the system and challenges there? Um, for many of our insurance companies, Lars, it, it does feel like that. Um, the costs are significantly more than were planned. Um, many are approaching this with a lot of caution, not wanting to go earlier on certain policy choices and trying to find out what the market view is on those. And I think many organizations are becoming quite critical of the IFRS 17 projects and programs in the same way as Insolvency 2, questioning what business value there is really from these programs. So yeah, there, there are lots of similarities to the Solvency 2 journey we've been through before. But I run, um, as Lars said, uh, the UK uh, consulting response to, to I4S 17, looking particularly at the operational impact. And I'm part of Alex Bertolotti's global team running a, a, a program of work that involves getting our top 30 clients together or client teams together to look at what are the uh, issues they're facing across the globe from all of their projects um, and, and I've summarized some of those insights on this page. I guess from the word go, when I started to engage around IFRS 17 five years ago, my key message was that it's never going to be easy. Never, ever going to be easy. Having lived the Solvency 2 journey, um, how Solvency 2 could stand alongside of our current reporting, IFRS is quite different because it touches every element of what we do in sometimes insignificant ways, but sometimes very significant ways. And so it really challenges the way the closed process in particular happens to deliver the financial results we report either internally or to the market. So from one of my recent calls, um, these five pillars represent the key structure of our conversation. What I have gleaned from what is happening across the globe in the projects we're running, as well as some of the projects I'm involved with directly here in the UK and in Europe. So just going through these one at a time, in the first point, what we're seeing is definitely a slowdown in the delivery um, of implementations. Um, some clients are doing their first and even second implementation of IFRS 17. And, and what, what do I mean by this? They're coming across some real issues around data and also real issues around the vendor's solutions around how configurable they are or do they have the right functionality. Um, one of the projects described the vendor's um, solution as, as, as being disappointing because you know, while they were great at delivering the GMM model, um, little to no focus was placed on the PAA model. And, and at a point in time, the VFA model didn't exist. Now, a lot of that is being fixed and a lot of that is on roadmap. And there are certain vendors that have delivered that, but there's definitely an emerging disappointment around the scalability and the extensibility of the functionality within these solutions. And so, as in with Solvency 2, what gets hammered is the cost on these projects. And some of those initial estimates that were set out around how long it would take to deliver, especially the system solutions, are being blown out the water. The second trend we're seeing across the globe is what we're calling the Plan B trend. Okay? Just to explain that to you very basically, a number of clients that have either bought solutions or built their own solutions once they start to get towards the back end of the development of those solutions, are encountering some of the challenges that is involved in taking those IFRS 17 calc engines and getting those into their ledgers or other reporting platforms. And so are realizing that it's going to take longer to scale the solution across the globe or scale the cruise solution across the entity or even to deploy the solution into territories that have not participated in some of those initial rounds of configuration. And so... 
what they're looking for is an alternative solution. They don't necessarily want to follow the same rule or route that we did with Solvency 2, where many clients crossed the finishing line with the tactical solution and then never actually went to a strategic solution. They want to continue pressing on with their strategic solution and might deliver that after the go-live and might deliver it in a more stable environment at that point in time. Definitely, many have underestimated the complexity of self-build or a vendor solution. I'll get to that later in my presentation. But the other thing that's coming out is not just about deploying technology, but some clients are starting to look at managed services, whether it's reporting as a service or whether it's looking for um, people to take on particular parts of the i 70 and critical path to provide a service to a particular client. And we're seeing clients, and I'll talk about this later on in my presentation, talk to us as PwC a lot, and other vendors even who have set up managed services to provide especially services, not necessarily for the main legal entities, but especially for some of the smaller legal entities or regions across their groups. The third trend that's emerging was when I spoke four years ago at one of our first global roadshows, um, we spoke about, I spoke about this idea that I don't like the, 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 the phrase minimum viable product compliance, because for me, you either comply or you don't comply. But what minimum viable product compliance means is what's the bare minimum we can do by way of solution configuration, process change, policy adoption, and so on to align ourselves to the standard. And what I can say to you is that many years on, as we predicted, we're seeing clients shift from minimum viable product compliance to more broader finance transformation. We see clients finally realizing that the roles and responsibilities they have around actuarial and accounting are not going to deliver everything that they need. And we're seeing this trend towards finance personas, personas around data, which I know Alex mentioned and was mentioned a few minutes ago also, being a massive challenge that finance has to drive. And also the impact that managing that volume of data and different types of data has on current processes people are realizing that this feels more like a finance transformation than just adopting another parallel standard alongside current reporting, solvency to any local reporting, and then having I-417 sit alongside of that. And yeah, the most important thing that's being discussed in this area lost many clients at the moment is, especially at a board level, where is the value? Where is the value? So if you wanna drive business benefits, I'm not saying you've gotta make your program a finance transformation program, but Clearly, we are seeing a trend in the market that people are moving towards transformation rather than just adoption. I guess the last two columns, and I'll go through those a little bit quicker, is some challenges around group versus local entity. Um, and what I mean by this is um, there are organizations that are struggling to deploy group-led policy into the local territories. I have a client in the UK that adopted a policy around materiality, as an example. I know Florian spoke about that just a second ago at a group level, thought they could roll it out over the, over the whole organization. The, the, the auditors felt that the approach was, was good and could be consistently applied. Uh, when the local territory and actually Scandinavia approached the local regulator about that to get some kind of insights as to whether that could be adopted, there was a massive pushback because for that organization, they were systemically important to that region. And so not just materiality, but there are several other topics where we're seeing an inconsistency between what group has to say around global adoption versus what local legal entities have to do because of regulators locally. And what that's driving is additional functionality build, a lot of pressure to, to, to adopt different ways. So in one of my clients at a group level, they adopted PAA and went through a massive exercise to achieve PA eligibility, only to discover once they had done that was that in one of their territories, they had to go for a full GMM model. And that doubled their bill costs, right? The third, sorry, the last point on this column is um, agile delivery. Just to explain this for a second, um, many clients you know, have seen that if you follow a typical waterfall implementation path that says, get all the policy set, do all the design, then do the build, then parallel run, just as you saw in our snake, that is not delivering the outcomes they were expecting. And as they go from the build into the data and into the parallel run, they are starting to recognize that the data that they have or the decisions that they've made earlier on in the process are, are not materializing the way they expected. And so they're turning to Agile 
as a way of trying to speed up the delivery. But let me say to you that the velocity that they were expecting because of adopting Agile maybe three or six months ago is not delivering in the same way that they expect it to be. So there is a, not necessarily a warning, but there is a concern, I guess, around, around how you might change your program to deliver the outcomes that you need and whether Agile actually could or can work in your organization going forward. I for a 17 was never going to be easy, is the message here. But the world has not stood still because of I4S17. If we go to the next slide, what we're seeing is that CFOs are still dealing with wider business challenges. There's still a massive challenge around back office standardization. There's a challenge around how to orchestrate data across the organization and what his finances role in that. There's a massive challenge around how do you continue to lead boardroom thinking around strategic cost optimization within the organization. Do we have the right expense base? How do we deploy this finite pot of money that we have in the organization to maximize the value we deliver to our clients? And are we leveraging what we're doing to modernize the organization? And we see these topics emerge over and over and over again as we have ongoing conversations with CFOs outside of the Arrive for a 17 program. Next slide, please. We know that I-417 is more than just a technical accounting standard. There is a massive shift that needs to happen in the operating model of organizations, even through I-417 programs. And CFOs are now starting to strategically shift, and we're starting to see these programs strategically shift away from policy and, and, and system, but more onto operating model and also digital enablement. Organizations are adopting one of three approaches, depending on where they've come from. There are those organizations adopting what we call a lead by people strategy. So looking at business process outsourcing, shared services centers, to labor arbitrage, all the way up to deploying a gig economy. How can we start to engage with third parties that will allow us to scale up very quickly the type of services or microservices that we might need to effectively deliver i 17? There's a lot of digital upskilling happening within finance functions. Things that we would not have seen before in finance functions are, are, now, are now there. And what we're seeing is also organizations through leading with people starting to think about how do we reward, reward innovation? Because you might not be able to fix it all in our I4 17 programs. Secondly, there are those organizations that are leading with process. And what we mean by this is no, not all processes are equal. And so people are trying to figure out which processes can deliver substance over form. How can we leverage business partnering and do that better? From a performance-led perspective, so those organizations that are leading with performance, they're looking at things like their rolling forecast processes and thinking about what the role of AI is with that. But we know that there is a significant focus on technology in i 17 programs at the moment. I want to say to you, technology has a role to play in a lot of these conversations, even on this screen, whether you're leading by people, leading by process, leading by performance. But it, it doesn't lead. Technology doesn't lead. Not all the benefits are linked, linked to big, customized technology delivery. So if we go on to my next slide, this is one of the most sought after slides by clients. Everybody wants to talk about this slide. In front of you, you have a layout of how we've assessed a number of vendors over the years around their ability to deploy the requirements in their solutions from the standard. And if I just go quickly and explain the slide to you, left to right, so from data sourcing to ma managing and mastering data to calculation to cash flows to subledger to workflow and so on. And then from top to bottom, those solutions that are either accounting-led platforms, so coming from the likes of Oracle and SAP and so on, data-led platforms coming from the likes of SAP and others, um, actuarial-led platforms from a life and non-life perspective, perspective, whether that's first profit, whether that's RESQ and so on, um, we do an evaluation around these. Quickly, four different trends to talk about. I don't know if you noticed on the slide, but there are very few full Harvey balls, right? The first message is, there is no perfect solution out there. The second message I want to say to you is that clients who are advanced in their thinking are starting to deploy solutions from multiple families. 
So clients choosing to deploy more of their actuarial platform solutions and use that to do the calculations, but also acquiring data-led solutions to do storage or even accounting-led solutions to do the accounting entries within their ledger. Um, the third message I'd like to leave to you is that there is still a lot of development to go in the vendor market at the moment. Those vendors who tell you their solution is complete, scalable, robust, and has all of the things that you would ever need, I'm not sure that is truthful. And I would say to you that those that are honest with you about a deployment roadmap as to what can be done to address some of the concerns that you raise are the vendors to listen to. And so, as we know with all standards, and we saw this even with Solvency 2, there's still a lot of development to go even way into after the standard goes live. And just lastly on this slide, to say that while there's a lot of actuarial solutions here, what we've seen over the last year or so is the resurgence of activity around the actuarial platform space. And so many more clients now looking to the actuarial solutions to do more as far as the IFRS 17 journey goes. If I go on to the next slide, many clients have asked for of us, you know, what 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 is it what is it that you PwC are doing? Do you have do you have a solution in this particular space? Where is it that you could be um, deploying? We could be deploying your thinking. So as auditors and as technology consultants, we've developed a solution called Inner Box, and we are really proud of the solution. It's recently won a Risk Tech Award listed in the leaders category, especially around completeness. And there are just quickly four things to talk about. In our solution, we have the opportunity to translate business requirements into the client's needs. We have a fully deployed, validated data model and data dictionary. We cover all of the bases around GMM, PAA, VFA, and also around um, models for reinsurance held. We have the ability to translate um, data through subledgers all the way through posting engines into, uh, into um, the client's general ledger solution. And we are currently using this solution to power our managed service, as well as deploying it across our audit teams to cross-check and validate as we move towards uh, engaging our Channel One clients from an audit perspective. We're immensely proud about the solution and are keen to talk to you about it if it's something that you want to do, even to think about it as a plan B option alongside your own build or vendor engagement at the moment. Lars, my time is spent and I want to hand back to you if there are any questions. Thank you, Alvin. Um, unfortunately, the audience hasn't passed any question through, but uh, uh, listening into your um, presentation and um, everything, I, I wonder perhaps if, if you want to reflect on a successful technology uh, implementation journey. Uh, what do we see in practice? Is it a lot of proof of concepts going on, or are it's a, how do if you want to advise in a minute or so how how to prepare for a successful vendor implementation journey? If you uh, if I can get your take on that one. Yes, um, quickly two things. F firstly, um, and I'm going to say this very respectfully it's time to be honest that no vendor has everything that you need. So, so having honest and upfront and frank conversations with the vendor um, and making sure that those reflect all the way through your engagement with them is most probably the first thing that will underpin a successful deployment. I guess the second thing is that you have a lot of capability in your organization that can be extended to deliver those areas that are not possible in a vendor solution, or even sometimes in your own self-build. Do not throw those away. Do leverage those better. And I guess thirdly, I would say to you that leaving it late is not necessarily going to lead to a effective implementation. The, the two pitfalls that I see, or the three pitfalls that I see, are data, data, data. And so, especially engaging earlier and being honest about what data is available, how you're going to have to integrate to it, and how you're going to have to <clears throat> enrich it is going to be fundamental to a successful implementation. Thank you, Alvin. That was um, really, um, really helpful. So, uh, thank you for participating, uh, and we'll be in touch on uh, other questions, I believe. So, uh, our last topic 
is uh, related to how, how numbers are presented on the IFR 17, as this will change. But in my dialogue with insurance companies, I've noted that many are interested in understanding how would it look like? How would uh, the figures look like in the new world? For example, for the PNC companies, metrics such as combined ratio and claims ratio are driven out of the current accounting, and they are well-established KPIs. Changing the profit or loss statement could potentially impact how uh, these KPIs are uh, calculated. But it's not limited to these ones. To be able to communicate ch changes uh, with, uh, with, uh, with your investor community and your uh, leaders and so on, you need to prepare. So Andrea Pride is one of our technical experts on IFR 17, and she's worked with the standard for many, many years. She is here to give us some insights on what we see in the market. As Alex also mentioned, we had two investor pr presentations the last two weeks, and probably she could shed some light over that one too. So, Andrea, how should our audience con consider KPIs and the IFR 17? Are they likely to change? Thanks, Lars. And I guess the quick answer to your question is yes, they're likely to change. Otherwise, what's the point of all this work if it doesn't actually result in better information, which really ought to feed through to the KPIs as well? And um, it's these changes that lead to the need for companies to consider how they can balance the challenges and opportunities created um, by the changes in communicating the results. So thanks for that slide. Um, so as the implementation data approaches, we're now seeing companies turn their focus to exactly that question, in particular, the impact of Agile 17 on their KPIs and metrics, both for external investors and for communicating within companies and to other stakeholders as well. And because Agile 17s is going to affect so much of a company's profit and loss account and balance sheet, there's going to be need, need to for careful consideration on how to define and communicate the changes to KPIs. And while there's been a lot of technical detail that's been the focus of much of the implementation discussion so far, there's also a need to step back and think about new and old KPIs and how they can be used to communicate the story of what's going on. So what's the metrics going to look like in the future? Um, well, in some areas, companies do anticipate retaining metrics that are consistent with their existing KPIs, um, like the volume based metrics related premiums and metrics focused on cash and dividends and solvency based. Those aren't necessarily going to go away. Um, and many general insurers have already indicated that they intend to use um, metrics which are broadly equivalent to their existing KPI. And I think it's quite natural really to seek to replicate what we have today, um, especially when you're unfamiliar with the new basis. But we might well see this evolve over time. For example, we could see new forms of volume measures given written premiums, for example, is not a concept itself under IFRS 17. In some other areas, um, companies will be expecting to revise metrics to reflect the features of IFRS 17, such as adjusted operating profit, which is an important KPI for life insurers. Um, and it's not just going to be possible to just roll forward the current definition in IFRS 4 or IFRS 17. And the adjustments might be more complex, um, for example, to adjust for some of the accounting mismatches that could occur under IFRS 17. And finally, we might see some new KPIs emerge, particularly around the contractual service margin or perhaps an adjusted CSM, which doesn't exist before, um, because this is an important measure of the unearned profit on new and existing business. And, and that's one which people are, are quite interested in, excited about. So um, the impact on the metrics is not just for analysts investors, it also affects internal reporting just as much as external, um, because often the same metrics are, of course, used to manage business, remunerate management, price new business, and so on and so forth. So um, the changes to IFRS 17 is also going to require careful internal stakeholder engagement. Um, so that needs time to plan um, for the design of key metrics, testing the results, having an opportunity to refine the design, alongside education of management and stakeholders um, so that everyone can get comfortable with the new basis that will be eventually they'll need to sign off on. And, and doing this sufficiently early is important so that the KPIs can be built in, in to the core systems, um, allowing for better reporting and more effective, um, more effective visualization dashboards, et cetera. Next slide, please. 
So although the mandatory effective date of 1st January 2023 still seems some time away, I think we've heard that it probably isn't. Um, and the opening balance sheet is going to be um, 1st of January 2022, which is actually really fast approaching. So the question of what investors and is, are actually going to be seeing and what KPIs companies are actually going to be producing is one that's getting increasing interest recently. Um, and we expect to have continued interest in this all the way up to the implementation date. We're seeing analysts and investors increasingly look to understand what they can expect from companies. Um, and it seems, however, it seems from some of the conversations we've had that um, the conversations between companies and investors is still often quite early stage. Um, so as others have mentioned, we've um, participated in and hosted a number of analysts and investor events recently. And there's definitely an increasing interest in IFRS 17 from investors and analysts. Um, and it's clearly an area that's resonating at the moment and will do so over the next 12 to 18 months. The sorts of questions we've been asked at these events shows that there is much interest, but there's also much uncertainty um, from the, the analysts. Um, so we get questions around things like timeline, process, implementation readiness, how companies are thinking about FRS 17, as well as the interest in actually what the new disclosures are going to show um, with concerns around whether IFRS 17 is actually really going to deliver the comparability that's hoped for um, and how IFRS 17 will interact with existing uh, metrics around cash and solvency. Another thing that people seem to be really interested in is how IFRS 17 is actually going to impact different types of products and what that means for consistency between companies and how it aligns um, with things like regulatory capital measures. So for me, there's two clear takeaways from all this. It's clear that comparability is a key focus for analysts, perhaps not surprisingly, and that that means that the industry would benefit from a consistent approach to defining any new or amended metric to aid comparability. Um, and the other thing is, is that management, analysts, investors, all of these will want to know well before 2023 effective date what the most critical KPIs are going to look like under, under the new basis. Next slide, please. So that brings me to my last slide, how companies will actually manage to transition effectively. Um, so on transition, companies might want to consider what information will be disclosed around the transition balances themselves, that in itself is an exercise, and what they represent in terms of the profitability for the, uh, the business for the past and for the future. Um, key judgments on transition um, will affect quantum of KPIs, including many of the headline ones, such as return on equity, both at transition and many years into the future, some of these will essentially lock in some of the KPI um, impact. We're also expecting that companies will be providing additional disclosure when they first implement IFRS 17 to help investors bridge between what was there before and the new metric. Um, investors are, are mostly looking to the companies to help them manage the transition. So they might want to consider whether they want to publish any transition information earlier um, as part of helping investors and analysts better understand the impact, the, the no surprises principle. Um, so in advance of transition, I think it's important to educate all the stakeholders on how to, results are going to differ to make sure that they're well understood. Um, because analysts are not familiar with IFRS 17 compared to other bases of reporting, and because they're generally focused on cash, they'll need to be educated on the impact on different products and different models and how that will ultimately impact on the cash. Um, and so the implementation plans need sufficient time for that engagement late this year and definitely throughout all of next year, so that by the time the results are first published, the risk of misinterpretation or miscommunication is minimized. Um, I think, finally, the change is, is an opportunity to improve market understanding of performance compared to reporting today. That's what it's all about, really. So I'd say that the key messages really to take away are to understand what IFRS 17 will mean for your reporting, um, engage in early stakeholder buy-in, it's vital, um, engage with uh, market uh, analysts and investors to manage expectations about what is coming, how much has changed, what the limitations are, and, and to help to bridge between what's reported today and what will be reported under IFRS 17. So you can distinguish between what is an effect of applying a new accounting standard from what's an effect that comes from the underlying business. Because it's equally important to explain what does not change as a result of IFRS 17. Um, and then all that should help you use your disclosures around the risks and the judgments that are inherent in IFRS 17 to, to tell the story. Lars, back over to you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, 
really uh, helpful, insightful presentation you had there. Um, at, at, the, at the very start of this, uh, this event, we got a question. Uh, and looking at the question now uh, and looking and listening to what you said about uh, timeline, I think uh, I'm, go I'm going to pass that question over to you uh, regarding uh, timeline. For the question we got was that uh, someone is still uh, asking for uh, a postponement of the uh, of the standard and investors are interested in the timeline so um, maybe if you could share some thoughts about this 2023 really going to happen um, well at this stage i think a postponement in the timeline is probably less helpful overall than more helpful because you know projects have a certain amount of um you know, they have a certain amount of trajectory behind them. Um, and I think that's something that if you, if you look at discussions around where the ISB was when it was postponing the deadline to um, 2023, was it was something that the ISB was very conscious of. Um, I, I see that there is a paper um, at the ISB for a discussion today, actually, about the comparative information in IFRS 9, which, which is pretty explicit about the timeline. And, and there's no hint of a, a deferral in the timeline being discussed as any part of that. So um, from the ISB's perspective, I think a uh, delay to the timeline is unlikely. Um, I think if you look at the timetable for endorsement processes, they all seem to be working hard towards getting to a, you know, a 2023 effective date. So I would have thought that that is also um, a challenge to get forward to the timeline there. Yeah, thank you. I, I do agree. And uh, reading the uh, comments letters on the endorsement in the European Union, I think it was emphasized that uh, quite a few didn't want further postponement as well. So, uh, Andrea, thank you very much for participating and joining to this, uh, this event. And uh, I'm going to try to wrap up what we had today. But before uh, I'll wrap up, I'll try to answer uh, some of the questions that we have got that we parked towards the end. Uh, and one question was regarding IUPA and how they are uh, viewing the work of EFRAG. And I, I don't want to go and move into the details of what IUPA think, but I noted that IUPA had a comment letter to uh, the EFRAG um, endorsement advice, uh, the draft endorsement advice. So I encourage you to, if you're interested, to see the IUPA U on uh, IRFS 17. You could uh, read that uh, comment letter. And the final question is whether the Nordic companies are uh, working together, uh, thinking, linking regarding IFRS 17. So I'm aware that, for instance, in Norway, we have uh, market forums where uh, the global uh, or the Norwegian players discuss IFRS 17 um, and the technical issues that there arise. So to wrap up this uh, event, uh, and I'm not going to talk about the Eurovision um, discussions that we have had uh, here either, but I note that the UK weren't happy and neither the Germans. But we have had the full agenda and reflecting on what we learned this morning, I believe that uh, we can say that for the Nordics, we do not have an aligned plan for how to implement IFR 17 in the statutory account. But uh, all Nordic territories are thinking about IFR 17 and work together. And we have quite a few uh, insurance companies that are advanced in their uh, implementation journeys as well. From the global perspective, uh, Alex noted that we do not is expect anyone to issue any figures before 2023. Uh, further, we also noted that we had an uh, expectation that many would move into a finance transformation journey, but fewer than expected did actually that. But Alvin later on alluded to saying that we see something in between. So a minimal viable product is not something that we see a lot of uh, going to do. Alex, uh, Alexander in Sweden noted uh, about the uh, European endorsement process. And whether we will have one global aligned IFRS 17 standard or we will have a European version with carve-outs for uh, annual cohorts and so on remains still uncertain. Uh, looking at the audit, I believe that a successful audit is what Morgan quoted to say, no restatements 
of your IFRS 17 uh, figures. Um, we also touched about four different areas that we are considering now. So if you start with the technical one, involve your auditors in the uh, eligibility assessments. Can you use PAA? Can you use VFA and so on? Start the discussions early to avoid any unpleasant surprises towards the end. IFRS 17 is system driven. So make sure that the auditors are involved to do the IT audit work and so on to make sure that the data quality is good as well. From a group uh, perspective, we do see some local uh, versions and local variations. So make sure that uh, from a group perspective, IFRS 17 is, uh, works across territories too. And also, IFRS 17 is an opportunity to design your internal controls to make sure that your um, internal controls over financial reporting works properly. This can also make uh, you gain proper comfort of your figures early. So move ahead, start engaged with your auditors and so on. Alvin discussed quite a lot regarding technology. And he emphasized a few times that IFRS 17 implementation will never be easy. Uh, some have started all over again. Some have started uh, to see what the vendors have done. And some are all the, actually doing two solutions at one point. So uh, as I all noted, from the minimum viable product to, uh, to a finance transformation, a lot lies between there. And also, a buzzword that I have learned from IFRS 17, or not a buzzword, but a word, uh, is agile projects. I believe that agile projects is something that we see quite a lot in the IFRS 17 implementation. Also, he also noted that CFOs shifts towards a more operational model. It's not just an accounting standard, but you also look at how it will impact the operational systems. And also, the vendors. He noted that no vendors have, it's not the plug and plug exercise, no one is entirely ready yet. So engage with your vendors and try um, to see what solutions and the honest vendors uh, is the one um, that you should listen to. Andrea wrapped it up with uh, KPIs. Um, it should be comparable. Comparability is what uh, a lot of users and um, investors and so on think about. The industry uh, will uh, require regarding the timeline or asked about the timeline. And I believe that she noted that it's unlikely to have a ISB postponement later than 2023. What happens in Europe is still uh, uncertain. Start educating both your investors as well as the leaders of your company. So before we wrap up, I will note that we will send the recording out afterwards. And for those of you who had issues with the sound at the very end, we will try to uh, edit that one to make sure that we have uh, good sound quality on uh, that section as well. So. We will also send out a link with the recording to this one, as long as we will also provide you with a link to our illustrative financial statements. There you can see how it would look like. So please do not hesitate to contact any of our professionals and have a great day and thank you for watching.